us today. So welcome. Before we introduce our speaker, go ahead and begin with our land acknowledgement. Crow Canyon acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus sits. Our work is not possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. We are grateful to all Indigenous people and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Thank you so much to all of our Indigenous partners. We are not here without you. Uh, as usual, uh, if you are on Zoom, if you have questions at any point during the presentation, if you put them in the Q&A, we will get to them. Uh, and sometimes things get lost in the chat if people start chatting in the chat. If Zoom gives you a headache, we are live streaming on Facebook and you can hop over there uh, to continue watching. And you can also find this and our past webinars on our YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed yet, please do. We have some awesome webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have on uh, October 10th, we have the Paleo Indian Southwest, the role of the greater Southwest in understanding the earliest Americans with Dr. David Kilby. Um, uh, there will not be a webinar on October 17th. It will be our annual meeting. So you can actually register and attend our annual meeting webinar. Uh, that week, but then the week after that, we have Dr. Lori Barkwill Love uh, talking about modeling early maize in the North American Southwest. So I hope that you will join us for all of these. And a huge thank you, as always. This is an entirely free webinar series made possible uh, only through donations. Thank you to all of you who donate to Crow Canyon in general and who donate, um, some people donate almost every week to this webinar series when they sign up. Thank you so much. We could not do it without you. Well, we were actually just chatting uh, before starting about our latest blog post. Uh, Dr. Susan Ryan, has been, who is the executive vice president of our research institute, has been writing some incredible blog posts this year. You can go back and see all of them, but her latest one on artifacts, materiality, and belongings, very, very uh, insightful um, analysis. Uh, please do check it out. It will give you a sense of where the field of archaeology is going and the kind of questions that we are asking ourselves every day uh, here at Crow Canyon as we plan our projects and programs and work with all of our partners. So please do check it out. Uh, without further ado, I'm kind of in the sense of, of where archaeology is going. We're so excited uh, to have Dr. Andrew uh, Gilreath Brown joining us today. Um, he will be talking about uh, indigenous tattoo traditions, but I want to uh, go ahead and share uh, his extended bio with you because uh, it is uh, so the work that he's doing um, even beyond uh, this work is so important and so in sync with what we're working on at Crook Canyon today. Uh, Dr. Gilreath Brown is a data scientist for the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication at Yale University and a research associate for the Institute for Geoanthropology at Max Planck. At Yale, uh, the Institute studies how people think, feel, and act around climate change and how they partner with organizations to help them build public and political will for climate action. He uses his knowledge of past culture, climate adaptation, and sociocultural and socio-environmental changes to inform current climate change communication. Uh, oops, I put something in front of my camera. Uh, Dr. Gilreath Brown completed his PhD at Washington State University in archeology span under the direction of our friend, Dr. Tim Kohler. His dissertation focused on socio-environmental systems where he reconstructed past temperatures in the Southwestern US and then use those data to understand the spread of maize into and throughout the U.S. Southwest, as well as the sociocultural implications of the agricultural demographic transition, uh, and also explore the relationships between environment, demographic changes, and the use of body art and modification. After leaving WSU, he was a postdoctoral scholar at the Scripps Institution for Oceanography at University of California, San Diego, where he worked on a new Holocene temperature and precipitation reconstruction for East and Southeast Asia to explore the relationships between climate and rice cultivation. At Yale, he uses his statistical, computational, and climate background to create models to show the geographic variation in climate opinions and how worried people are about different types of extreme weather events. Uh, his institute conducts scientific research on uh, public climate change knowledge, attitude, policy preferences, and behavior, and the underlying psychological, cultural, and political factors that influence them. Just the little things. <laughs> We're so grateful to have you with us, uh, Dr. Gilbert Brown. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Oh, thanks for having me. Go ahead and share my screen. Um, can you see that all right? It's perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly, uh, as we've um, heard the um, Crow Canyon uh, land acknowledgement, I also want to acknowledge uh, where I am, that you know, Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including the uh, Mohegan, the Mashantucket, um, Piqua, the Eastern Piqua, and the um, Scott uh, Tecook, uh, the Golden Hill, um, Pegasus, the Niantic, and the Quinnipiac. And, uh, and along with other uh, Algonquin uh, speaking peoples have stewarded through generations uh, the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. Uh, we honor and respect the enduring relationship um, that exists between these peoples and nations um, and this land. Uh, I also want to just uh, briefly acknowledge that uh, the historical data and that I'll be presenting today is uh, primarily from ethnographic literature and is uh, not, uh, uh, not a complete representation of all the tattoo designs and the meaning and the extent of tattooing in the so Southwest, um, given that uh, it is a, a one-sided um, look at um, the tattooing um, through those sources. Uh, I am in the works um, since I published some research several years ago in 2019. Uh, that I have um, talked with um, several indigenous scholars and am wanting to present more of an indigenous driven narrative about tattooing in the Southwest over time, um, but that's still um, still in the works right now. Uh, I also want to also briefly reference uh, and mention uh, that I will be uh, that I will mention uh, mummified people. Uh, in this presentation, but I will not share, um, and there will be no images of mummified people um, in this presentation. So just to briefly uh, start, uh, we're not going to cover all the history of tattooing because it would be hours, uh, but I just want to briefly kind of talk about um, tattooing across the world, how we kind of get to this point, um, just very briefly before focusing in on the Southwest, which is our uh, primary um, focus today. So we kind of know that early on during the Upper Paleolithic, that um, which is around 45 to 10,000 years ago uh, or so, that people were uh, decorating their bodies and using ornamentation to communicate with others. So for example, people uh, likely use gastropod shells, like you see the ones here. Uh, on, the, on the slide um, to create different necklaces and jewelry to uh, communicate different types of information. Uh, interestingly, this happens at a time when uh, populations really begin to increase, uh, not, as, not quite as much as during the Neolithic um, later on, uh, but we do see uh, increases in population during this time and people um, having to kind of navigate the landscape in, in slightly different ways than they did before. Uh, tattooing, of course, is very different than these ornamental practices because tattooing is uh, an irreversible commitment. It's permanent. Uh, you know, during the, the early days, there were there were no tattoo removal shops, uh, no places to get uh, things lasered off um, like they are now. So fast forward a bit um, to, uh, uh, to tattoos. Uh, we know from direct evidence and here by direct evidence, I mean, uh, we can see actual tattoos on mummified people uh, that have been recorded um, from over time. Uh, we know that the practice of tattooing at least goes back 5,000 years ago, though likely it goes back um, later than that. Uh, you can see that uh, kind of around Egypt as well as in Europe um, are kind of the earliest instances of mummified people with tattoos uh, around 3300 to 3200 BC. Uh, and so you can kind of see the distribution and, and across time uh, that we have of, uh, the, of current direct evidence um, of tattooing. Uh, just a couple uh, examples um, of individuals. This is, of course, a reconstruction of Utsi the Iceman um, that was found by two hikers melting out of a glacier um, on, in the Alps on the border of Austria and Italy. 
Uh, if you've heard of a tattooed mummified person before, it's probably Utsi. <laughs> um, been on tons of documentaries and, and stuff before, but he had uh, 61 total tattoos across his body, uh, dating to about 3200 BC. Most of the designs on Utsi are usually simple lines, um, both parallel and perpendicular, um, occurring lo across lots of places across his body. And then the other one that's more or less uh, contemporaneous is from Egypt, um, so from the pre-dynastic period. So these were uh, naturally mummified people. So it wasn't it wasn't until later on that you had um, mummies that were inten intentionally wrapped, mummified people intentionally wrapped. Um, so these are from the Gibeline site in Egypt. Um, again, more or less contemporaneous with Utsi, uh, but this is the earliest evidence that we have of, of figural tattoos. So uh, on, uh, and both on male and female uh, individuals, uh, there's a possible sistrum, which was an Egyptian rattle, uh, some birds in flight, um, a possible sheep, possible ram um, tattooed on, on one of the individuals. So those are, those are kind of the er our earliest evidences of, of direct evidence. Uh, as far as the distribution uh, kind of across the world of tattooing, uh, we see it kind of all, you know, nearly across most, most of the world. Um, there are some exceptions uh, from 1200 to 1900. Uh, this map kind of gives a, a general distribution um, of some of those practices. And this one um, from Lars Krutak's book, um, Tattooing Arts of Tribal uh, Women. Uh, Lars is kind of the leading tattoo anthropologist, uh, whereas um, Aaron Dieterwolf is kind of the leading tattoo um, archaeologist um, out there. Uh, but in, in Krutak's book, uh, he recorded uh, and showed uh, kind of the distribution of, of lots of different peoples uh, and cultures that have practiced tattooing um, more in the historic, and more recent period, as well as um, some of the ancient examples like Peru. So now we can kind of uh, focus in on the uh, Southwest and there's of course lots more and lots of variation around the world, uh, but we wanna focus in on the Southwest here or I'd like to. So uh, tattooing, the tattooed body was uh, a vessel um, printed by successive generations of indigenous belief uh, that it once embodied both uh, personal and social and ecological and metaphysical metaphysical values um, through uh, really a wide array of visual um, symbolism. So as a cultural practice, it was deeply rooted within the me memory of ancestral and daily everyday life. Uh, tattooing defined local perceptions of existence. So before the uh, impacts of uh, colonialism introduced uh, Western diseases, missionization, uh, forced acculturation, uh, tattooing was practiced by many indigenous groups um, throughout the Southwest. Um, as you can see here, uh, the, the specific tattoo designs, uh, the underlying uh, symbolic meanings and cultural values, when and by whom uh, tattoos were applied, and the tools and techniques used in their creation uh, vary um, quite a bit between region, between indigenous group, uh, as well as by time period. So although many of the ethnographic studies document um, tattooing uh, in the 18 to 1900s uh, throughout the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico, uh, these sources often uh, provide very few details about the meanings uh, or rituals associated with tattooing. Uh, and one of the reasons is that um, tattoo traditions in the Southwest were in severe decline uh, by um, the late historic period um, because of forced acculturation. So one of the earliest uh, textual references uh, uh, refers to the Akamel Oodam uh, and uh, where we see uh, Frank Russell uh, kind of um, conveyed this idea of the of the decline in uh, in tattooing uh, when he uh, visited, uh, and he says that uh, while all the older uh, members of the society were tattooed, the young people are escaping this, and in the case of painting, the practice of the art of tattooing is passing away, 
and the meaning of the designs is unknown, at least from his, his perspective. But in addition to this, uh, ch to the changing traditions and loss of corporate knowledge, uh, Western ethnographers and historic uh, chroniclers um, rarely questioned um, informants as to the internal meanings and cultural beliefs associated with tattoo traditions. They tended to focus more on uh, the physical tools themselves and what they were using. Um, but also uh, it may have been that that knowledge was kept um, secure from outsiders with good reason, um, that it was um, kept from ethnographers, not shared um, for, um, because it was internal knowledge not to be shared with outsiders. So as a result, the kind of social context of these processes uh, and practices is often uh, kind of entirely absent from the literature uh, or it gets uh, very downplayed as to just being simple adornment, uh, personal preference or relations between uh, the sexes. So although tattoos and their meaning vary um, greatly between groups, uh, there are some uh, general um, common trends uh, with the importance of tattoos and the tattooing process and what uh, kind of types of events generally that they are associated with. Though um, how tattoos are used during those events, um, again, varies between uh, group. And I will um, talk about and mention some um, specific groups um, when I talk about the uh, kind of commonalities. So as I mentioned, the, the earliest textual evidence that we have is from the 1500s um, for the Akamel Oatham, Oatham and uh, also for the um, Humanos as well uh, during the 1500s. And so through ethnographies like the one by Krober in 1935 for the Wallapai, uh, we find that women uh, used both uh, paint uh, on their face uh, in addition to tattooing. So a lot of times they use these um, in conjunction with, with one another. And from uh, ethnographic historic uh, research, we see like a really wide array of different designs between groups. You can see kind of um, some of the different differences between the, the two here, just the um, few examples shown here of how designs may differ between uh, groups. Uh, in the Southwest, um, as kind of seen elsewhere in North America, the uh, application of, of women's tattoos at uh, puberty function as marks of adulthood among uh, several groups like the Kohia, uh, the Kokopa, the Kumiai, uh, the Pipash, and um, the Yavapai. So in addition to kind of dem demonstrating membership uh, in the society of the living uh, that tattoos would do, uh, the presence of tattoos among um, several groups like the Kokopa, uh, the Kwasan, uh, the Mojave, and the, and the Pipash also granted access um, for de deceased souls um, to the ancestral realm uh, of the dead. Uh, tattoos were applied as part of mourning rites uh, among the kum Kumiai and Kohia and acted to invoke um, spirit guardians and serve as conduits for uh, supernatural en energy uh, among the uh, different, some groups within the Apache. Uh, tattoos were also employed or used uh, for both uh, medicinal and, and therapeutic uh, marks and purposes, uh, including as an aid in conception uh, among the Yavapai and the uh, Apache, uh, and also as a way to slow down the effects of aging uh, among the um, Akamel Oatham. And the kind of last uh, historic account I just want to briefly mention is uh, uh, the story of Olive Oatman that you might have heard of before. Uh, but essentially in the, in the early 1850s, um, she was a typical pioneer girl heading west uh, on a wagon train uh, full of Mormons in search of golden God, uh, mostly going with her family. Uh, but by the end of the decade, she was a white woman uh, with a chin tattoo, uh, kind of torn between um, the two cultures, not really fitting in, into um, either one. 
essentially, she was um, orphaned at uh, 14 um, after her family got into a, into a fight um, with the Yavape uh, uh, people uh, in northern Mexico, now southern Arizona, and pretty much uh, most of her family died except one of her um, siblings. Uh, Oatman then spent um, a year uh, as a slave to the Yavape uh, before she was tra traded to the Mojave, uh, who uh, essentially uh, who uh, brought her in and brought her part of the uh, tattooing process. And as part of that, she got a chin tattoo. Uh, and as, as much as we know of, you know, what the story is, uh, that th they raised her um she pr participated in in daily events and and things like any other um, person in the in the group uh but fast forward four years later um kind of under the threat of war uh essentially um some white people wanted uh saw that she wasn't a part of the group and were trying to get her back and so they threatened uh, war uh on the mojave and so they eventually delivered uh, gave her um back um, to avoid that in exchange for um, several different um, uh, blank blankets and things like that. Uh, so at the end, she is, you know, walking around with this, you know, permanent uh, marker um, for the rest um, of her life. Um, for the, for the most part, um, she never, she went on to get married and, and everything. And she uh, never really um, talked about, um, of those events very much um, beyond um, beyond that beyond a couple of um, small inter interviews and things like that. <clears throat> so in the Southwest, uh, we have kind of a better idea of some of the tools and materials and techniques that people use uh, for tattooing. Uh, tattoos uh, within the Southwest were generally applied by uh, directly pricking the skin with single or multi-point tattoo implements. Uh, so what we kind of consider hand poking uh, tattoos was the primary means, uh, but some of the groups in like Northern California and Southern Oregon, uh, you know, out of, out of the Southwest, but uh, you practiced um, skin cutting. Uh, so that was actually where you would um, cut the skin. You could use things like obsidian um, and then you would put the ink, put the pigment inside um, after, after it had been cut. So a little bit different. And for the most part, we uh, don't see that even historically um, within the Southwest. So it was probably primarily uh, hand poking um, tattoos. Uh, there are uh, farther north um, into Canada or today Canada, um, they used other things like um, subdermal puncture uh, tattooing. Um, so that's going uh, a lot deeper into the skin. Uh, some of that is uh, doing things like actually kind of like sewing um, into the skin. Um, so a uh, quite a bit deeper than um, what a simple puncture is, which is usually only a few millimeters. So uh, tattoo implements uh, included a variety of different tool forms um, overall, such as uh, flint, obsidian, sharpened bull, bone implements, uh, plant resources like um, cactus spines. Uh, and that's kind of what we see as being the dominant, uh, dominant implement within the Southwest is uh, either a single or clustered uh, cactus spines. <clears throat> like this replica here on the on the left, uh, prickly pear cactus is kind of overwhelmingly uh, the, the main one that we see uh, historically and ethnographically. Uh, but there are other accounts of like tree cholla, uh, barrel cactus, and uh, saguaro um, cacti as well. Uh, cactus spines were also kind of used um, to tattoo uh, among the Arapaho on the Colorado Plains, by the Cahuilla, by the Chumash. Uh, the Halkodoma, uh, the Lipan Apache, and Opata in Cal California. Uh, we see it in West Texas and in northern Mexico as well, in, in northwestern Mexico. So really where you have, you know, cactus spines available, uh, available on the landscape is, is generally where we see those being used because it's a readily available material. 
So there are several um, historic examples of uh, cactus spine uh, tattoo tools uh, from the greater Southwest um, that are in uh, ethnographic collections, uh, like the one here from the that's in the uh, National Museum of Natural History. Uh, this one is from, uh, as I've already mentioned a, a few times, uh, the Akamil Oatham uh, uh, and from Arizona. This was collected by Frank Russell um, for the Smithsonian in, in 1902. Uh, the kit also includes uh, mesquite charcoal for making pigment, along with uh, four tools of paired uh, prickly pear cactus spines. So the uh, image that I showed before was a replica of, of this particular uh, tattoo tool type. And the tips of the spines were uh, bound with cotton fibers and uh, the shafts were tied with sinew. Uh, historically, both men and women were both tattooed um, on their chins, lower eyelids, and elsewhere on their faces. Uh, although there, uh, there were male and female tattooists, uh, one source noted that women practitioners uh, were preferred uh, because they were more careful. Uh, another example is this tattoo uh, kit from the Kumeyaay uh, in California, uh, collected by Edward Palmer in 1875, that consists, uh, consisted of these two bundles of uh, unknown uh, cactus spines um, that were about nine centimeters long. Both bundles are wrapped uh, with cordage around the midsection of the spines, causing the points to kind of spread apart uh, from one another. Uh, another uh, tattoo type that I didn't, that kind of follows under the simple uh, puncture like uh, hand uh, poking is that uh, sometimes uh, we have like things like tattoo stamps and that is to uh, create, essentially create a certain pattern with it. So it's very possible with, with this um, tool that they wanted to create um, like spread out points um, or, um, other, or other types of designs. Um, to almost kind of imprint uh, those designs specifically um, into the skin uh, uh, is also a possibility. Uh, some of the other uh, materials that we see are mesquite, mesquite spines uh, for the Kokopah. Uh, these are from 1885, and uh, they were usually held um, or tied in a bundle of two to three spines. Uh, and used with a charcoal pigment or charcoal ink. Uh, tattooing of the Kokopa uh, girls took place around their first menstruation and was uh, accompanied by songs and dancing. So generally, uh, tattooing was done as a, a very communal event, uh, whether, uh, a, with, whether just with um, a group of women um, or with the community as a whole uh, versus how we usually get tattoos today, which is you, it's usually just you and your tattoo artist, or maybe it's, if it's your first time or so, or for special purpose, you may go with a fr friend or just one other person. Uh, usually don't have a, a room <laughs> uh, watching when you're getting a tattoo uh, uh, today. Uh, whereas this was a very kind of a communal uh, event uh, that bonded um, people together. Uh, so they also believed that the presence of tattoos um, granted, as I mentioned before, uh, sole access to the ancestral realm, and that at death, an untattooed woman could not attain happiness and comfort in the next world. Uh, instead, her soul would be um, scratched by beetles and sat bent over on the road so that other souls stepped on her back as she um, passed by. Uh, preserved uh, cactus and mesquite spines appear in archaeological deposits um, from the Southwest, and Northwestern Mexico going back to about 3000 BC, uh, but very few of these are associated with, um, with, uh, with pigments uh, or could be even conclusively uh, identified as, as tattoo tools. So historic uh, tattoo uh, pigments in the Southwest were composed mainly of uh, carbon based. So like using like charcoal, ground charcoal, uh, uh, or soot or pine pitch. Uh, so you can create a, a relatively simple um, tattoo ink or a pigment uh, just by mixing ground charcoal uh, with water. Uh, but several other ethnographic sources from the Southwest in California also reference tattooing uh, with red ochre, uh, red clay, red paint, um, and evil, even uh, green uh, vegetable pigment uh, to get uh, different 
uh, different colors, uh, or in some cases it might have been um, for medicinal purposes as well of putting um, certain types of plants um, within uh, the plant oils within the tattoo pigment as well. Uh, and kind of regardless of the source, raw pigments were diluted using water uh, to achieve the desired um, consistency. Um, prior to uh, application. Um, but how old is uh, tattooing uh, in, in the south, Southwest? What evidence do we have, you know, archeologically uh, for tattooing in the Southwest? Well, kind of in the absence of any textual evidence, uh, there are kind of three main lines of archeological evidence that we use for, for tattooing, which is um, preserved skin. So like an, an mummified uh, person as we talked about before, and then um, ancient art and the actual tattoo implements and tools um, themselves. So decorated uh, ceramic and human effigy vessels from uh, across the Southwest and, and Northwest Mexico uh, include depictions of individuals bearing red, black, white, and other colors of geometric designs uh, on their bodies and faces. Uh, which have long been kind of interpreted as, as potential, uh, put the emphasis on potential <laughs> representations of tattooing, uh, because it's always possible these things also could represent body paint, clothing, uh, other types of body, body decoration as well. So uh, what we have is some, some possible tattooing or body decoration depicted in painted uh, ceramic art from, uh, from regions, as you can uh, see here, uh, ranging from ancestral Pueblo people to the uh, Membres region, to the Hohokam, uh, Salado, Casas Grandes, Chaco, and ancient Hopi, uh, Mojave traditions, and, and, and many more. And, and what we see is that kind of in addition to these types of in images that appear on ceramic effigy vessels, is that uh, even earlier we have these uh, both fired and unfired uh, ceramic clay figurines uh, from the Southwest that have these different patterns of um, incising and punctation uh, and painted designs that again might correspond to uh, tattooing, but again could be uh, those other uh, forms of decoration uh, or, or something else. Uh, so you can kind of see this in this uh, bottom right example from Prayer, Prayer Rock from the Basket Maker 3 uh, or from or this one from uh, uh, Canyon de Chez in uh, Arizona that have these uh, kind of punctated uh, designs in them. But some of the earliest examples uh, within the Southwest actually go, go all the way back to the early archaic period. So we're talking 5,600 to 500 BC or so. And some of these marks uh, depicted on human bodies and ceramic and, uh, art and figurines, um, particularly those which appear on chins of female figures uh, correspond closely to what, we, what I showed you uh, with the historic and ethnographic images. So it might be tempting to, you know, say, oh yeah, that's on a female uh, figurine. Uh, it's on the chin. It's it's got to be a tattoo. Uh, but uh, we really don't have, you know, def definitive evidence um, that that's what's going on on these figures. Um, so as I mentioned before, historically, uh, uh, women mix both uh, face paint and uh, tattooing. Um, so you have both both going on. Uh, so it's not really possible to show uh, the intended uh, meaning behind those on these figures. Um, so at the, at the very least, it, it shows that body decoration uh, or could potentially go back to uh, at least the early archaic. Uh, but again, we can't be definitive um, on, on those. Uh, the same can be true for what we see um, in rock art. As well, so this is an example. Uh, this is from Newspaper Rock, Utah. Uh, of course, there are you know tons and tons of panels uh, across the Southwest and over into California uh, of uh, anthropomorphic figures with uh, you know different geometric designs um, on their bodies uh, and around sometimes around their head. Uh, this is the San San Juan. Uh, 
uh, panel from Butler Wash. Uh, and so you could see that, you know, we see the, you know, simple lines and geometric shapes uh, that are used a little later on uh, with, uh, with indigenous groups. Uh, so again, it, it could represent tattooing, but again, we don't really know because um, there are several other things that could represent. So we know that it, we at least know that body decoration itself goes back um, thousands of years uh, and body decoration, uh, including tattooing, uh, can mean uh, several different things um, in general in terms of uh, showing what your uh, place is within a so society. Uh, so, uh, you know, an, an elder, uh, somebody older um, that has a lot of knowledge uh, may have particular tattoos. Uh, it also demonstrates group affiliation, uh, defines social roles and values, um, economic status. And uh, as I mentioned before, these were uh, communal uh, events. Um, so there were ways to tie communities um, together. So uh, as we talked about, some of the figurines um, and other artifacts date um, to the um, basket maker periods um, or earlier, uh, but I want to focus in on the basket maker two and three period. And so this is uh, a general, uh, this is a period where people really kind of began to transition from mobile hunter gatherers um, to settling into more permanent areas. Uh, people began increasingly relying on maize and, and storing it. Uh, so, for example, in, in southeastern Utah, uh, we see during this period, uh, you know, a real increase of reliance on, on maize um, through, stable, through stable isotopes. And uh, so I want to focus in on one site in particular uh, in southeastern Utah, which is the, which is the turkey pin site. Um, in the Bears Ears uh, National Mo Monument. And this is a covered uh, rock shelter. Uh, so it's had really good uh, preservation, uh, kind of protected from the elements. Um, it's kind of named after, uh, there's lots of uh, turkey copper lights uh, here. Um, so it's kind of named after, uh, named after all the uh, turkey uh, from the site. And we'll end up kind of focusing specifically on the Basket Maker II period um, of the site, about 500 BC to 500 AD, though it wasn't occupied that entire time here. So um, part, uh, so the site was unfortunately like looted um, quite a bit um, in the 60s, 70s, um, and before that. And uh, so Dr. Bill Leip and, and Dr. R.G. Matson. Um, planned a excavation to try to find some intact deposits uh, in 1972. And so they set out to, uh, they found some intact deposits and they excavated a kind of small, really kind of small area, but um, they uh, bagged um, all of the, the, the soil columns and matrix and um, had to carry them out. Um, uh, Dr. Light, uh, Bill told me that uh, they actually had to like organize uh, donkeys because the site was so remote, uh, especially then. It's still remote today, but it was even more so then. Uh, so they had to put everything on donkeys um, to get it back um, like several miles. I think it was like seven miles or something um, kind of rid ridiculous. Um, but the preser preservation of the site is fantastic. Uh, there's, you know, whole corn cobs and kernels. There's human hair. There's both uh, turkey and human uh, copper lights or fossilized poop. Uh, you have a hair uh, implement down there in the bottom right, uh, a animal bone game piece in, in the bottom left. Uh, the site's been used for uh, tons of different uh, things. Kind of the most notable is that uh, the ancient DNA on some of the turkey uh, remains uh, show that the Southwest was an independent uh, domestication event um, of turkey. And there were it was also some really interesting ancient DNA work on uh, maize from here and showed how uh, it had become adapted to uh, fewer growing degree days um, and, and cooler conditions than it had been when it was first domesticated down in the central bosses uh, region where you have thousands of growing degree days uh, where it's very hot, um, lots of heat accumulated days. And so this is kind of the central column. And so you can see, see in the photo how like 
well-defined the stratigraphy is here. Uh, there's been something like 30, uh, I forget the exact number, like 20 to 30 uh, radiocarbon dates just for this one uh, column. It all tends to date between 1 to 200 AD. Uh, so all the dates are very tightly uh, constrained. So it's a very well-dated uh, uh, context. And so what happened was that I was working for the Washington State University Museum of Anthropology in 2017 uh, while I was a student at WSU. And uh, Dr. Leib had gotten a grant from the BLM um, to do some additional like documentation uh, and making sure that the materials were curated well. And really what all had been done with the, with the, with the collection as well as uh, digitally uh, scanning in uh, lots of the old images on the cartridge <laughs> cards. And so uh, as I was working through the materials, I ran through this, uh, ran across this really interesting artifact and never seen anything uh, like it before. Uh, and so I kind of jumped into like trying to figure out um, what it was and I uh, thought, you know, maybe is that staining on the, uh, you know, like ink staining on the tips? I'm not sure, but I'm going to first figure out, you know, what is, what is this thing made, <laughs> made out of? And so it all kind of, that all kind of get kicked off with me uh, reaching out to Karen Adams, who many of you probably know, um, a well-known paleoethnobotanist and archaeo uh, archaeobotanist. And uh, we were able to figure out pretty quickly from uh, microscopic images that it was a uh, lemonade a sumac twig and that the wrapping was from uh, yucca leaf strips. Uh, but the difficult part uh, was figuring out, you know, what these two things protruding out of the end uh, were. Uh, and so essentially I started doing some uh, microscopy work, um, particularly on, uh, these are images from uh, a scanning electron micros microscope. So you get like super good uh, detailed resolution uh, more so than you can on your kind of standard microscope. And so I just collected like as many different like cacti spines as I could different genus and species and uh, agave and yucca, uh, just trying to get uh, image anything I could to try to figure out, you know, what, it, what these were on the artifact even did some uh, 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 porcupine quills uh, just out of curiosity <laughs> to see what they look like uh, under the under the uh, under the SEM. And so what I figured out is that uh, the surface structures of different cacti spines and agave and and yucca are all pretty distinctive, at least at the genus level. And so I was able to figure out that the that these on the artifact were um, prickly pear uh, cactus spines. Can't tell you how many times I got uh, poked by uh, <laughs> spines when I was trying to collect uh, all the samples and everything. But uh, so at least at the genus level, we can figure out uh, what what these were. And so uh, prickly pear cactus, which again, as I mentioned before, uh, is primarily what we see. Uh, historically on tattoo tools of the prickly prickly pear cactus spines being used uh, in particular. Uh, there was a really interesting study a few years ago that showed that uh, prickly pear was like particularly like more efficient at going into uh, things like uh, like cows or horses walking by and, and things like that. Um, that was pretty interesting and uh, kind of supports maybe why uh, Indigenous people chose to use the pr prickly pear cactus spine uh, in particular. Uh, so one of the other things I did was to, you know, try to figure out, you know, the wear patterns that I see on the end of the this tattoo uh, of this tool. Uh, you know, can I see the same thing if I create a replica uh, of these tools and then and then go through the tattooing process myself, not on myself. I didn't do it on myself, but uh, we use uh, pig skin um, because it's a good, uh, so this is only going in about two to three millimeters. It's, it's super zoomed in. So it looks like it's <laughs> uh, really deep. Um, and this is on pig skin um, here. Uh, because it's a, you know, it's a really good proxy for human skin. Uh, you, you know, even if you ever watched the show Mythbusters back in the day, occasionally they would break out uh, pig um, because it's a really good proxy 
when they weren't using their the ballistic, ballistic gel stuff. Uh, and so I went through the process. I got some uh, pig um, pig skin and uh, tattooed uh, just using a basic um, charcoal and uh, water mixture. And you can get pretty solid lines within a really short amount of time. And so I did uh, microscopy photos before and after. What I found was that um, the wear patterns are, are pretty, sim pretty similar between the two. Uh, even these like striations um, that you get from essentially from larger pieces of charcoal and the pigment that are pushing into the cactus spine as it goes into uh, the skin. Uh, the other thing I, I did was to try to figure out if, if they did use um, other things uh, in the uh, tattoo ink on the tattoo tool, uh, whether you know iron or manganese was present. And uh, essentially what I found out was that no, none of this were present in, in this. And it looks like it was just a, a carbon charcoal uh, based ink. Uh, again, collect charcoal from around the fire, grind it up, mix it with water, and, and you have your tattoo ink. So this tool dates to uh, about AD 100 um, within that, uh, or a 79 to 130 uh, age range. Uh, and again, within that one to 200 um, for the whole column here. Uh, so that kind of uh, established the um, early evidence uh, of tattooing within the, within the Southwest. Of course, there could be other instances that are, that are earlier, um, but uh, it at least kind of uh, defines um, that uh, a starting point. Uh, you know, are there other uh, other examples uh, like that archaeologically? Uh, well, we we do find some other uh, cactus uh, spine implements um, archaeologically. So at Aztec ruins at Aztec West in particular, uh, in the Great Kiva, uh, Earl Morris recovered a possible tattoo artifact that consisted of multiple cactus spines uh, bound with yucca leaf strips. So using yucca again, uh, but also this was on a reed handle. So a little bit different uh, and more cactus spines than just the two. Uh, this tool wasn't discussed actually in the report, um, but it was um, pointed out by uh, and identified by Laurie Webster uh, back in 2006 um, when she worked on the preservation of the materials. Uh, there is a, a separate tool that uh, Morris did describe from room 73 at Aztec West that also had a reed uh, handle uh, with multiple cactus spines. Um, but unfortunately, that one's not illustrated in the report and it hasn't ever been successful, su successfully um, relocated um, to actually even be re-examined, at least according to Laurie back in 2017. So maybe it's been found by now would be great. <laughs> Uh, there are uh, lots of other instances of tattoo tools in, in the Southwest. Uh, so Upper Ruin Cliff dwelling in, in uh, Tonto National Monument. Uh, this is where the uh, uh, saguaro uh, cactus spines um, come in that date to uh, the 14th century AD. And so you have these saguaro spines um, that were bound together again with yucca fiber uh, and their tips were set, actually set closer together um, so maybe trying to uh, create that single point, um, but being more efficient than just using two. There's also evidence of using uh, agave tips and spines that may have been used for tattooing or um, scarifiers uh, in uh, the northern uh, Kalia, uh, as well as um, several other, other artifacts with um, cactus spines as well. Uh, they actually tested um, the agave tips and uh, found uh, human antiserum or uh, whatsoever from uh, blood on the tip, on several of the tips of the agave um, tips spines. So uh, as far as designs, as, as I said before, we can really only look to, you know, some of these uh, uh, effigy uh, vessels that, and, as well as the historic uh, literature on you know, the types of designs, maybe uh, prehistorically that people were using. Again, they're probably simple uh, geometric uh, designs. It's unlikely that they were uh, figural uh, type things, um, but these organized um, dotted patterns uh, as well as other uh, geometric shapes and, and designs. 
Uh, also wanted to mention that uh, from that there's one a Western uh, Pueblo uh, oral history that notes that tattooing uh, might have been part of uh, a dark history of their clan people um, along with warfare and, and human sacrifice. Um, according to this narrative, uh, ancestral Pueblo people uh, chose to turn away from those practices that were seen uh, as negative, uh, at least in a colonial context, uh, and so abandoned uh, tattooing, uh, which comes from the, it's the 2013 uh, Hayes Gilpin and uh, uh, Loma uh, Tiwama uh, article uh, from 2013. Uh, because there, there's generally been very few things uh, written um, about um, tattooing in the Southwest. Uh, so for most cultures, tattoos were bestowed on individuals to mark um, adult, adulthood, uh, group identity, uh, as we've seen in some of the historic examples on uh, different meanings about gender and ethnicity uh, and status, uh, family history, um, or to record uh, personal status uh, and accomplishments, uh, and, of course, and of course, uh, to agree the degree uh, you've seen, uh, and at least historically, uh, that this does vary on on what uh, different groups were using them for, uh, and what they were conveying behind those. Uh, if you're interested in the kind of like archaeological um, slide. Uh, of the Southwest as well as some of the ethnographic stuff um, published an article in 2019. Uh, it's open access, so you should be able to uh, freely um, access it um, with no issues. Uh, if not, you can reach out to me and I'll happily send it to you as well. Uh, thank you um, so much. Um, feel free to follow me uh, on my uh, Instagram uh, if you're interested. Uh, thank you so much for having me and I'll uh, take some questions now. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, it is, you sort of mentioned uh, right there at the end that there really is very little uh, written about tattooing uh, in the Southwest, uh, in the archaeological literature, in the ethnographic literature. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, I think, I, I don't know, really. It's, I think it's part of it has been uh, that, um, there, depending on who I've talked to, there seem to be a there seems to be somewhat of a dichotomy of like whether people uh, some people some groups in the, in the Southwest actually tattooed or not, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think maybe that's part of it. Um, but yeah, and it, do you think there might given some of the archaeological uh, evidence that that you just walked through um, from you know pre pre contact sites. Do you think there was a, a shift, maybe that, that more more prominent earlier in time, and something something might have happened uh, uh, as we get to the modern era, and it and it seems less less prevalent, culturally prevalent. Yeah, well, I, I think for the as far as the decrease uh, historically, I think that's primarily from the forced acculturation and and forcing uh, indigenous peoples to uh, you know adhere to uh, European. Uh, in Spanish, uh, where, um, you know, tattooing wasn't really like, you know, <laughs> it wasn't highly looked upon, um, especially like within European uh, history, you see that being, you know, associated with like criminals and, and, and people like that, uh, or at least portrayed that way. Um, yeah, yeah, good answer. Um, a couple a couple questions uh, popped up in the Q and A. Uh, do you have any um, sense? Someone asks uh, uh, with Plains cultures if if uh, tattooing was common there as well. Yeah, I mean we do have uh, sorry have the automatic lights, so that's why it's so dark. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> and I'm on the east coast, so all the uh, be yeah, going home. So so we definitely see um, there are several instances uh, and I, I didn't touch on them too much uh, within um, Texas, uh, as well as kind of more more up into uh, the to the Great Plains. Uh, there is, you know, evidence there as well. Um, but yeah. But uh, it, one... it has been my primary focus, but uh, but uh, both Lars Krutak and Aaron Dieter Wolf um, talk a little bit more about 
kind of the br broader expanse across the U.S. One of our uh, viewers asked if there's any any evidence or anything you run across with respect to uh, scarification, i.e., non-inked. Yeah, um, so I just I kind of br briefly um, touched on that that we uh, there is um, you know the uh, the agave um, spines uh, from that one site. Uh, may have been used as a scar fire. The person interpreting that kind of interpreted after, you know, what's done in Mesoamerica. There's also a site in Texas that has, um, it's actually like a rodent jawbone um, that they think might have been used as a scar fire uh, as well. Um, I think there needs to be actually more on uh, scarification. It's, uh, every, I, f I find increasingly the more I, I talk about this, I get uh, additional questions about it. So, uh, so I think people are really interested in it. Um, so there are a couple examples, um, within the Southwest and over into Texas of, of possible scarification, um, not uh, as much directly in the, in the Southwest. We primarily, at least historically and ethnographically, we primarily see the, the hand poking, um, used. I think, uh, as is normal, people are kind of asking about different cultures. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen any references available to uh, to, to Yaki or Yaomi um, uh, practices? Yeah, again, I would um, uh, I would look um, I would look yeah I would look deeper into um, yeah Lar Lars Krutax and and Aaron yeah. Dieter Wolf. Uh, they have some really good. Um, they both written several books, um, um, particularly Lars on the kind of anthropology of tattooing and covering uh, lots of ground there. So. All right. Where, uh, are you thinking of, of going someplace next with this research, different kinds of questions or investigations? Yes. So, so one of the things that I, um, so I, I shared that, that published article, uh, but uh, one of the one of the things that I had mentioned at the beginning is that I had been reaching out to um, some different indigenous scholars and uh, even did like a media training uh, with Adine uh, that, um, that was yeah super fantastic and, and really, really helpful just to think more critically about presenting things. Um, but uh, my hope is that, so I have this, you know, kind of summary of uh, historic and ethnographic literature but again, that's primarily written by white anthropologists. Uh, and so I would really like to, you know, have the indigenous perspective driving that narrative rather than just white, old white anthropologists from 100 years, you know, 100, 150 years ago or even, even longer um, is what I'm hoping to kind of do next. Um, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Uh, are you getting, seeing some, some interest, uh, from, uh, descendant communities in the, in the topic? Yeah, yeah some, uh, and, um, yeah, some, uh, and that was kind of, I mean, that was kind of, uh, so I got like quite a bit of news coverage when that article came out, uh, but, um, uh, my actual favorite article was, uh, the, by the Salt Lake Tribune, um, because they actually interviewed, um, a couple of people from the Dine, uh, and uh, got their perspective on it. So that was like super interesting. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think more of that and putting um, the indigenous uh, driven part of it first and foremost is kind of the most important thing. Yeah. Fantastic. I think we, uh, let's see, a couple more questions popping in, one of which I'm not really uh, uh, familiar with what, what they're asking about, but evidence of use of tattoos for tag band numbering on reservations. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a good, good question. Uh, I'm not sure if they, um, I, I don't know any of the history about that, yeah. if they, if they did. Um, but I really want to go look into it now because I'm super yeah no <laughs> um, absolutely but I but I don't know yeah 
Wonderful, amazing work. We're coming right up on five o'clock and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I think we'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your research with us uh, and for publishing it open source. Yay, open source. Uh, we believe in that here too. So uh, we'll be, be looking uh, at your work and uh, please come back, come back in yeah. person. Uh, yeah. It sounds like it's, you know, eight years or so since you've been out here, which yeah. is way too long. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, thank you again so much for having me. And um, yeah, people can feel free to reach out to me if they have any additional questions. Fantastic. All right. Well, have a wonderful night and we will hopefully talk to you soon. Thank you.